let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Jesus and the lawyer were parrying each other with questions. What do I do to inherit eternal life? What do you understand by the law? Ah, yes, said the lawyer, but who is my neighbor? You will have heard about the bright young Jewish student who kept pestering the rabbi with questions and eventually said, the trouble with you rabbis is that when you ask them a question, they can reply to you with another question. And the rabbi said, so what's wrong with questions? <laughs> Having preached sermons for 50 years and more, I hope I am not surprising you when I report that I have been reading a book about the Bible. I have read or consulted many books about the Bible, but this latest one, which I've had for 10 years and more, is especially helpful and readable now that I've got round to reading it. It's called Whose Bible Is It? It was published in 2005, written by the eminent historian and theologian of Yale University, Yaroslav Pelikan. I have had close to my desk two of his other books, Jesus Through the Centuries, subtitle His Place in the History of Culture, and its neighbor, Mary Through the Centuries, Her Place in the History of Culture. Both of them beautifully written, beautiful books, covering the period over these 2,000 years, tracing the changing and developing ways in which our Lord and his mother have been honored and followed across the centuries. The book about the Bible follows a similar pattern, tracing the development of the books of the Bible and charting the ways in which they have been regarded and presented during these years. The author, in an introductory chapter, emphasizes the priority of spoken words over written words. And in that context, emphasized what Jesus had in common with the Greek philosopher Socrates. Socrates had enormous influence, but wrote nothing. All his words were spoken. And it was for these spoken words and unwritten ideas that he was officially condemned and put to death. Professor Pelican says that practically everything he has written about Socrates could be applied to Jesus. And I wonder if it has ever occurred to you, knowing as you do that the epistles were written before the Gospels, that the first words of Jesus to be written down are these in the first epistle to the Corinthians. Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And the words, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me first words of Jesus to be written down. The book also tells us that the first century scholar Philo, thinking of the beginning of the book of Genesis, wrote that it is quite foolish to think that the world was created in six days or in the space of time at all. And I've come across people in the 20th and 21st centuries who are prepared to fight and argue about their claim that the world was made in six days. Here is somebody almost 2,000 years ago poo-pooing that notion as silly. Pelican reminds us that the New Testament canon, the list of books we have in the New Testament, 
appears for the first time in the year 367, and that the first Bible to be written with numbered verses was printed in 1550, before which only chapters were numbered. He tells us that the book of the Bible most read and most frequently commented on in the medieval cloister was the Song of Songs or Song of Solomon, which was usually allegorized Christ being the bridegroom and the church the bride. He also reminds us that the great scholar Jerome translated the Bible into Latin in the fourth century and that that Latin Bible was the only Bible in this country and throughout Europe for a thousand years in Catholic countries after the Reformation for 1400 years. There are, as part of the history, accounts of all the books of the Bible helpfully abbreviated. The prophet Amos, from which we had the first lesson, receives two sentences. Amos directs his prophecy against social and economic injustice, coupled as it was with a smug trust in the correctness of Israel's worship as a secure guarantee of its future. You alone have I singled out of all the families of the earth. That is why I will call you to account for your iniquities. He booms out in a denunciation of such smugness wherever and whenever it has appeared. The writings of Amos in the 8th century BC do not denigrate worship or the temple as worthless or even wrong. What he attacks is the use of religious ritual to justify social injustice. The notion that if you get the religious side right, you have more of a free hand with how you treat your fellow citizens, especially poor people. Nowadays, in the 21st century, social justice will seem important to some extent, but religious ritual will be regarded by most of our contemporaries as at best a hobby for people interested in that sort of thing. Does that apply even to church members, even weekly worshippers? Take, for example, the Ten Commandments. Do the first four matter? Are not the significant ones the prohibitions of theft, murder, adultery, lying, and even the honouring of parents and disapproval of envy? Though I'm not sure how many of the people would vote for the honouring of parents. Certainly more than would vote for the Sabbath. But there is no, no suggestion in the Bible that only five of the Ten Commandments mattered, the others being a sort of introductory window dressing. Of course, religious ritual was not to be used as an excuse for ill treatment of your fellows. But that did not make religious ritual a bad thing. If some sort of balance is sought in the Bible, a balance of religious duty and social or political commitment, is some comparable balance required in our time of personal faith and practical Christianity. For many, the heart of Christianity is a personal relationship with Christ now, with practical and community service closely connected to that personal relationship. Whereas to others, the notion of a personal relationship to Christ is quite far from them, and what matters is the church's worship and service. I wonder if the second group feel at times intimidated by the first and with a sense of failure and inadequacy at not having the right internal attitudes. In the 
parable of the Good Samaritan. Suggestions lead us in two directions on that matter. The first being that what matters is the service of neighbor. The second involving the religious profession of priest and Levite and the religious status of Samaritans. The German theologian Gunther Bornkamp wrote, it is therefore of great importance from whose point of view the story of the Good Samaritan is told. Placed in the position of the wounded, the hearer experiences also the approach of the Samaritan, from whom the Jew here by the wayside may not expect anything according to current thought. But to his astonishment, he is seized with compassion and helps him. And he who has made the inquiry as to who his neighbor is, is himself all of a sudden asked in return, which now of these three do you think proved neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? The question, who is my neighbor, has been changed into another, to whom am I neighbor? And probably for many people, the significance of the parable lies in the call for us to care for those who need us. There is, however, another side to the parable's significance. The priest and Levite were unable to help the wounded traveler because their duties in the temple did not allow them to touch a dead person, and the man in the ditch might have been dead. Their religious duties were taking precedence over neighborly care. The Samaritan, however, was regarded as beyond the pale by devout Jews, and he was used by Jesus to illustrate the breaking of religious and ethnic barriers in the cause of neighborly service. It is not enough to dismiss religious duty, just as it not, is not enough to ditch the first four commandments. Jesus was quoted as saying, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In our world today, religion is powerfully present with great capacity for good and great danger, though it may not seem so in this country. To use religion and not be enslaved by it is not only valuable, but necessary. Amen.